So the population composition is going to influence our antimicrobial choice. If you have endospore formers or if you have mycolic acid producers, you're going to choose different um, chemicals or different mechanisms than you would if you had um, straight up E. coli that don't have as many protective mechanisms. So endospores are extremely protective of the DNA and they can survive in environmental um, conditions that are unfavorable to other organisms. Protozoan cysts, which are similar to endospores, but they're for the protozoans, so eukaryotic organisms. They can survive in environments that other microbes would not be able to survive in. Um, mycobacterium, their waxy cell wall, inhibits chemicals that are typically used to kill microbes. Pseudomonas species, so we um, have in our lab Pseudomonas arginosa, can actually grow in, in the presence of many disinfectants. And so some of those disinfectants that we use in hospitals, um, iodine, stuff like that, Pseudomonas just grows directly in them. And that's one of the reasons why Pseudomonas is a very common nosocomial infection producer. Body fluids, dirt, um, these can this can interfere with antimicrobial agents. And so you always want to make sure that the environment is as clean as possible before you add those antimicrobials. You know, if I'm if I'm cooking chicken and I'm cutting it up on my counter, I want to wipe up all the chicken goo and juice before I spray any um, Clorox bleach spray on my countertop because otherwise the um, environment, the materials that are there are going to interfere with the Clorox bleach itself. Certain items are going to be more risky than other items. Anything that is going to enter the, a, a host's tissues, so um, think of like needles, scalpels, those are going to be more critical to make sure, or those are going to be items that need to be cleaned and um, sterile more than something that's going to sit on the body, so a stethoscope, a blood pressure cuff. Um, intermediates would be things that enter the body, but don't, or enter through a hole in the body, but don't actually penetrate into the body itself. So um, catheters or um, tracheal tubes. Those enter through openings from the external environment, but they don't actually go into the body, if that makes sense. Well, if it doesn't, ask. And then what is the item made of? There are some items that are, are going to be very effectively treated using, um, say, dry heat and other items that you probably couldn't use dry heat on. No, that you definitely couldn't use dry heat on. So the composition of the item is going to influence your choices. So now let's talk about how we kill microbes. We don't kill microbes instantly. It's not like you spray um, Clorox, Clorox bleach spray on your counter and all the microbes are like, Oh, I'm dying! They don't die like that. They actually die exponentially just like they grow, but it's a much slower exponential rate. And we actually use a um, 
term called the decimal reduction time or the D time to determine the agent's killing effective, effectiveness. Um, the D time is going to be the time given to kill off some microbe at under specific conditions. Um, D time kills is the amount of time it takes to kill 90% of a population off. And um, whatever the D time is, it's going to be at a specific temperature. So, you know, the D time of this chemical at 60 degrees Celsius is four minutes. That means every four minutes you're killing off 90% of those microbes. So if we have a population of a million bacterial cells and we have a D time of five minutes, then it would take about 35 minutes to kill off all the cells. And so to do this, we just take and re remove a decimal point. It's D time, decimal reduction. So you start here with the decimal, you move it over. You go from 1 million to 100,000 in one D time. Then you move it over, 100,000 to 10,000, then to 1,000, 100, 10, 1, and now here you're at point 0.1, so you've killed the micro. And since the D time is 5 minutes, you have 5 times 7 is 35. So now we're going to look at the different types of uh, mechanisms. And the first we're going to look at are some physical control mechanisms. And we're going to look at heat, so moist heat, dry heat, filtration, and radiation, okay? Moist heat destroys through irreversible denaturation. Um, so here's an egg. And when, so all of this clear portion out here, that's protein. That's called albumin protein. And when we cook an egg, we've increased the temperature. We change the shape of the protein. That's called denaturation. Um, and this is an irreversible process. So with boiling, or with moist heat, we have boiling, pasteurization, and steam, pressurized steam. They're all moist heat mechanisms. So boiling is the first mechanism we'll talk about. It does not sterilize an environment. Endospores can survive boiling, the boiling process. You only heat the environment up. Um, to about 100 degrees Celsius, which will kill off a lot of microbes, but not all microbes. Pasteurization heats the environment up a little bit more for a short period of time and then cools it very rapidly. Again, this does not sterilize, but it does reduce the population of microbes and Specifically, it reduces the population of microbes that are um, causing food to go bad early. Okay, spoilage microbes. There are two types of pasteurization. Um, HTST is the most common form of pasteurization. We're heating the environment up, and then we're cooling it down very rapidly. So we heat it up and then cool it down. And this is how we pasteurize the majority of our milks and our juices. But we now have another ultra-high temp pasteurization that heats the environment up so high, um, keeps it there for a short period, and then cools it uber rapidly. This allows us to kill those spoilage microbes and allows the the material milk or juices to be safe 
for sitting on shelves and you can leave them sitting for weeks and weeks on shelves versus traditional pasteurization allows milk to last for you know a few weeks in the fridge this can allow milk to sit on shelves for months and then when you're ready to use the milk you just stick it in the fridge cool it down and it's usable in many countries this is how they store their milk and it actually makes a lot of sense we're kind of a weird country in that we, you know, have our milk sitting in a fridge at a grocery store. And we know that it's going to only last for a certain amount of time. If we just ultra um, pasteurize, then we could leave it in our cupboards for a long period of time. It's just a weirder mechanism. We're not used to it. The one mechanism using moist heat that does sterilize is pressurized steam. And so this is what our autoclave does. Our autoclave uses pressurized steam to increase the temperature to about 121 degrees Fahrenheit, or I'm sorry, Celsius, or 250 degrees Fahrenheit. This um, so the temperature at 100 degrees Celsius is boiling, but when we increase the steam or the pressure, it causes the temperature to rise. And we can leave it here for about 15 minutes, and that will actually kill endospores and other materials. So to be safe, when we are autoclaving bacteria, so all of the materials that you're using um, in lab, we actually heat it to 121 degrees Celsius, and then we keep it there for 30 minutes just to make sure that everything is killed off. Though we can kill off um, the majority of all microbes, prions cannot be destroyed in the autoclave at that temp. It takes prions, prions are those infectious proteins, um, you have to heat the environment up higher to about 132 degrees Celsius, and you're going to have to leave them there for four or more hours in the autoclave. And that still may not destroy the prion. Canning is another mechanism that we use to um, protect foods and to allow for um, foods to last for a long period of time in the or on shelves um, the most common types of foods that we can vegetables and fruits prior to can commercial canning um, people would can foods themselves and a lot of times this could lead to if they don't do it the proper way could lead to um, certain endospores that could still grow so the foods that are commercially canned are considered sterile and they're considered um, free of all life whereas if we are trying to can ourselves you have to go through classes to learn how to can properly if you want to sell your foods because of the um, potential for botulinum toxin or endospores to be found there dry heat is not near as effective as moist heat it takes a longer time for us to use dry heat to kill the microbes than it does um, with moist heat. They, they work the same. They still denature proteins, um, but they also are going to use oxidation um, of the cell wall, cell membrane, um, to kill the microbes. So we use dry heat in our lab all the time when we are sterilizing our inoculating loops and our, our inoculating needles. That's using dry heat. 
Um, and so here I'm showing you the biohazard containers that we use. Um, all the biohazard materials are going to be um, sterile or are going to be run through an autoclave to sterilize the environment so that we can toss the material. The, the, in our lab, we will use dry heat to sterilize our loops and needles. So, so again, you're looking at the composition of the items and um, in the biohazard containers, there's a lot of different types of microbes and a lot more of the microbes. So we can't just burn them all. It would take a long time to do so. Filtration is another physical control mechanism. Filtration uses um, filters to keep microbes from moving through uh, and getting into typically, you know, some liquid or maybe into the air. Um, microbes get trapped in the filters and so they don't get through and then the environment on the opposite side of that filter should be a lot cleaner. Um, there's membrane filters have very small pores, depth filters um, have larger pores but they're very thick and so they're still going to keep microbes from getting through. And then um, high efficiency or HEPA filters are the filters that are used to trap microbes from the air. Think of the microbes that cause um, allergies. The last mechanism of physical control that we'll talk about then is radiation. Radiation uses um, Way, energy waves to kill off microbes or to, to keep them from growing. So the radiation that we look that we're looking at um, is not in that visible light spectrum that we see. It's going to be um, waves that are that we don't actually use for light. So ultraviolet rays versus gamma rays, okay? Gamma radiation is ionizing radiation, um, and what gamma radiation does is it breaks DNA up. It just destroys DNA. It breaks up the DNA so that you can't replicate. It destroys the cell membrane, um, which then can cause um, free radicals to form, and free radicals, when free radicals form, they bind to anything. And that can actually lead to cancers, which is why radiation is so bad for humans as well. Um, but when we use this on fruits and vegetables, it actually can keep our fruits and vegetables healthier, or not healthier, um, from spoiling for a longer period. And so here's my little joke about that. Um, irradiation using gamma rays kills off the bacteria and fungus that cause um, food to spoil. And here's a joke. Your Honor, when my client agreed to be irradiated, he was assured that nothing could possibly go wrong. And then here we have, you know, Mr. Potato Head back here with eyes and hands in different spots. Ultraviolet radiation damages DNA. It does not damage the plasma membrane or anything, but what it does is it causes um, thymine dimers to form. So wherever we have two thymine next to each other on our DNA, the thymine will bind together, and that causes problems for the microorganisms because they no longer can replicate their DNA and therefore can no longer um, replicate their cells. And that's what a thymine dimer looks like.
I'm going to stop here and we'll get into chemical mechanisms next.